Good afternoon and welcome back to day two of the Lightning Talks with me, Dan A. Uh, thanks to Matt again for the opportunity to host these. We've got some great talks coming up this afternoon, uh, leading into Filippo's roundup of the hackathon later. This afternoon being my local type, of course, this morning or this evening, depending where you are. Uh, just a quick reminder to, uh, to transform is ongoing. There's plenty of other stuff going on around here. And remember to hang out in the chateau and get to know our speakers. If you have any questions, ask them in T21 general, general chat in Swung, or directly to the speakers. And also don't forget to grab your merch from the Software Underground store, as there's some very cool t-shirts, mugs, all kinds of stickers and all kinds of good stuff. Um, with that introduction done, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Raquel, if you'd like to come to the stage and uh, introduce yourself. So I'm gonna ask you the standard three questions the, from yesterday, number one being, how long have you been part of Software Underground? You are muted. Sorry. <laughs> so my name is Raquel Teodoro. Uh, I joined the Slack channel last year during the Transform conference. But I know Matt Hall since 2015 because I have participated in a hackathon or in Calgary organized by Matt. According to him, I was the second woman participating in a geo hackathon. And at the end, I received two Arduino kits, one for me and one for my son, who was at that time 12 years old. Now he is 18. I have some pictures if you allow me to show. Uh, I will share my screen. Oops. Ah, oh, I am this a wrong screen. Okay, now it's correct. No, not yet. How do I change my screen? So you need to stop sharing and then reshare. I have to go to the correct screen and, and reshare. Yes. OK, sorry. OK, now I, here is my team, Ben Bouguet. In the computer, you see the project, G Launcher. And here are some pictures of the groups that have participated. And the Arduino kit here that I have received from it. Um, so uh, that event was a life changing for me because nowadays I code more than I, I work with geology. <laughs> and um, I love geology, but coding is something that came to stay. And I feel myself more complete professional when I'm coding. Great. I think that also covers the other two questions. and which were, of course, what are you working on now and one random fact. So if you'd like to add anything more, uh, then please feel free. Otherwise, I will hand the floor over to you for your five minute lightning talk presentation. Uh -huh. Yeah, um, uh, what I'm doing right now is that I'm looking for a job and I'm learning, trying to become fluent in Dutch because I live nowadays in Belgium. And one random fact is that I like to meditate and to practice yoga. Great. Well, the so, floor is yours for five minutes, and I will join you at the end. OK. Uh, so hello, everyone. My name is Raquel Teodoro, and I will, uh, just a minute, I have to turn off my, just a minute. Ah, OK, I will continue. So hello everyone, my name is Raquel Teodoro and I will present today a package that I have developed with the data from my master's degree. I started coding in it about it in, 19, in 2018 when I was pregnant of my second child and first girl. And since then I have been creating new functions and improving the package in my free time. I am Brazilian, member of Geo Latinas and I hope this package is useful for you too. So what is PyType? 
PyTie is a package that helps you to create a time depth table and a synthetic seismogram since the quality control phase. I have noticed, for instance, that only part of my data was being imported to the interpretation software, and this was impacting in the seismic well type. When I looked more carefully to my data, I saw that each well had more than one file, uh, and, and also the files could be divided in different columns, as you see in this right figure here. And this was only the beginning of the problems. In total, PyTie has 26 functions, and you can find them in the GitHub website uh, in, the in the week section. Uh, the, each function has a, its documentation, and I can show you now how to access it. Uh, first, you have to import the PyTie functions as PyTie. Here, I have already set it up uh, the last files uh, addresses of one well, uh, and here the function, the first function of the package. To access the, the documentation, you press Shift and Tab together. And here you have in the first line an example that you only need to copy and paste to run the function. So here you have the outputs and the inputs. One of the inputs is already here. And now I have to set up the another inputs. One of them is last files. That is equal to len last files. The other one is dtid that in my file is sonic sonic and the row b id is bulk and the depth id is depth so each file will have different names you have to be uh, also uh, attentive to that each, uh, each word has to be unique inside of your file. Otherwise, the, 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 the code gets confused and doesn't run correctly. So now I run the function. And voila, now you have the DT merged. All the DT files and different columns are merged in one single column and also the row B uh, log. And now I'm, I'll go back to the presentation. And, uh, and you can ask yourself, why am I being so meticulous about seismic well tie? Because apparently it's a, some, uh, something simply, simple to do. But it's because one well can sometimes change the whole geological model. Here I have a well drilled in 1959. And this well has only two types of logs, SP and lateral log. And with a work colleague, I got to, to, to tie this well to seismic, and the result was a new interpretation. Here in the upper figure, you see the interpretation of Moriak and the Barros from 1990. And the lower figure is my interpretation. The difference between these two interpretations is that uh, for Moriak and the Barros, the basement is at 900 meters of depth. And for me, it's in, in 3,500 meters of depth. And this is a huge difference uh, because for Moriak and the Barros, the shallow area of campus basin is, is not part of the petroleum system. And in this new interpretation, I am considering uh, the shallow area of the campus basin as probably a new petroleum system inside of the same basin. And here you see the result of the all the functions of the PyType package. Uh, the first two images are the reflection coefficient, synthetic seismogram with and without gain. And the last one is the synthetic seismogram with a different frequency. And that's it. Uh, I will be in the chateau in one hour because now I have to pick my daughter up in this at this school. But you can find here my contacts. And thank you for your attention. Great. Thank you for making the time to share. Really interesting talk. Apologies to everyone uh, for the stream quality during that talk. Um, I suggest you contact our 
speaker if you want to see more about the notebooks uh, in depth as they didn't seem to come across too well but uh thank you so next up in the running order is nate from studio x uh so if you'd like to come to the virtual stage as uh, raquel finishes up then we can get things working so Nate, before uh, before we get into your presentation, I'm going to ask you the same three questions I've asked all our speakers. Number one is, how long have you been on the Software Underground? Yeah, so I've been uh, with uh, for four years, also joining after uh, a great hackathon in Houston in 2017. Great. And what are you currently working on, hacking, or excited I, I, about? Yeah, I'm doing a, a little bit of a, a light data exploration right now. Uh, a lot of people in Texas right now are, are complaining about like serious allergies. And I'm wondering if it has something to do with that hard freeze we had in February of this year. And so I'm pulling all the pollen and weather data for Houston locally and trying to see if, yeah, if we're in some sort of, there's some sort of correlation between kind of number of days below a certain temperature, number of hours versus um, kind of the amount of pollen uh, that, that gets put out during the springtime. So just some light data exploration really that's, that's, that's pretty cool it reminds me, a long time ago i did a similar project of uh, how many hours of daylight versus how many cups of coffee were sold on <laughs> uh, on a major breakaway <laughs> when i was working for a coffee company at the time so i'm a fan yeah. of those kinds of projects and finally yeah. before we let give you your five minutes one random fact you want the software underground to know yeah uh well i'm i'm, I'm really good at falling off my mountain bike uh bike I could I could go pro here pretty soon if, if that was a thing. Um, yeah, uh, if I'm not sure if I'm doing it right, but I, I'm I'm definitely falling off a lot. So anyway, having fun though, and haven't, haven't broken anything just yet. Great. Well, with that, your five minutes starts now, and I will catch you at the end. Great. So um, yeah, thanks for everybody for for attending today. Today, I want to talk about a, a, a learning challenge that I helped to write for Zeek, which is the data science platform associated with, with um, uh, Studio X. And it's called Indirect from the Source. You can go check it out now. The idea behind this challenge was that there is a, there's a lot of folks out there that you know they, they've had that introductory sort of Python course. They're feeling really jazzed, that they're excited about it. And then the day after the course, they get back to the office and they just go back to making PowerPoints all the time. Um, so the idea behind this course is really that that really uh, entry level sort of geoscientist, let's put something out there for them so that they can kind of build up their skills, they can learn a couple more tricks and they, 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 they can continue improving. Um, so you can go to, to the, the, the website below. Uh, the challenge is open for the next year. Uh, there is a cash prize, but it's actually tied to um, how good your post is in the discussion board. Uh, it's just an open challenge. So um, the idea behind this is that you are a geologist working in this imaginary basin called the Pluto Basin. And you are given um, uh, a bunch of oil samples, uh, their geochemistry from the oil samples. And you need to figure out which source rock did these oil samples come from. And uh, this is based off of my real world experience about kind of dealing with this data. Geochemistry data is an amazingly rich data set and you can learn so much from just a single sample. But it is so messy, it is so crazy messy that um, had I had more skills with Python earlier in my career, I would have been able to sort and do a lot more. So this is kind of the inspiration also for this challenge. So. We walk through a couple of steps. Uh, this is the starter notebook that I'm just going to show a couple of uh, instances from. And again, this is designed to, to help kind of those early, early coders get going. So the first step is just inspect the data. So we load the trifecta. We look at the columns, we look at the first five rows, we describe the data, uh, and then we plot the data. Now, if you're familiar with oil chromatograph data, you immediately recognize that this is not chromatograph data. This is just synthetic data that we built for just this, this, um, this, just this study. Um, but it has a lot of real world sort of elements to it. Uh, and one of those elements is that it's very dirty. So we put a couple of hurdles in there uh, to, for you to clean the data with. So um, if we look at sort of three different curves of the chromatograph, 
the first one is that the, the data is spiky, and this mimics oil-based mud contamination in in the uh, in the sample. The second is that there's a bunch of zeros that are kind of just everywhere in the data, and that's just because some of these machines, when they were processing the sample, had errors, and so they, the number got outputted as a zero, so you have to overcome that. And then lastly, they're scaling. So depending on which lab did your, your geochemistry analysis, you can have wildly different numbers for your values. And so we, we set out some examples, give you some suggestions about how to normalize everything so that way you have a standard data set to be working off of. <clears throat> the next step is generating test data. So we want you to build a machine learning model just to, to predict these things. Uh, and to do that, you need to build synthetic data. This is, uh, we give you some tables that are loosely based off Schlumberger uh, 1987 uh, that give you sort of all the different oil parameters, their mean standard deviation, and what family they belong to. And then show you just kind of a very simple way how you could just randomly generate just kind of a fake oil sample. And then ask you to kind of scale that up so you can build a really big database of synthetic oil samples. The next step then is to build that predictive model, uh, in which case we're just laying out some, some uh, psychic learn sort of basic steps. Uh, we link to a very nice blog about that also at the, in, in this part. Uh, and the idea is to, to, to get those oil samples that you have and generate a, a label. Now the next part is my favorite part and the, is where you, you take your data and you put them back on the maps that we gave you. And in the case here, this is a, a kitchen map for uh, where your different source rocks are likely to be mature. And the idea here is that um, we've built the, the data table here with a couple of samples that are just always going to be difficult for a, a machine learning model to predict. And so this is where the geologist needs to step in and manually edit them. And so what we want you to do here is iterate on your model to the best of your ability. But at the end of the day, to get a perfect score on, on the site, you have to go in and you have to manually edit based off of your geologic uh, uh, prowessness. So with that, thank you, and go check out Zeke.ai for, for more challenges. Great. Thank you for five minutes exactly. Um, um, yeah, some great, great challenges up on Zeke. I had a, had a little poke around coming soon and, uh, yeah, coming and already and going. But thanks for making the time this morning. Uh, don't forget to grab Nate in the chateau or in the chat if you have more questions about uh, Zeke and uh, even those are very cool. Very cool ideas there. Uh, our next speaker coming up should be Julian, who should be joining the chat uh, shortly. In the, mean in the meantime, I will probably fill in with the two minutes. Say this is the second year we've been doing the lightning talks, and it's really encouraging to see people who were in Transform last year come, coming up. And here is Julian. Okay, so yes, uh, do you know, I think it's easiest if I give you the virtual floor as there's a bit of an echo. So if you'd like to start sharing and I will count your five minutes down. Hello, can you, can you hear me? Uh, Julian, it's, uh, there's quite a bit of sort of feedback, feedback. or something. Yeah, I yeah have... no, I have It's like caramba. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, it's, I, uh, it's it's a weird loop with um, YouTube, whereas I'm on. Okay, I can't hear the other. Oh, maybe I can, but I don't. I don't think I can hear the other voice uh, yeah, as much just, now. So it's, it's not as bad. The... Close the YouTube if you're watching it while you're. Yeah, watching. yeah, I've I've stopped it. Sorry, but it's there is no speakers on, so I, I don't know where it comes from actually. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. Could be a sound, but it seems to have fixed itself. So good. So how long have you been with the software underground? Uh, I I do I don't um, I mean I've joined for the hackathon in uh, Aberdeen. That's the the first physical encounter. I've I've kind of followed Agile for a while, and. Uh, I guess maybe when the first 52 things came out, I restarted following um, what was all about software as <laughs> an open source. 
So, yeah, so that's took quite a few years. I'm not too sure. Cool. And what are you working on or excited by at the moment in the world of software underground? Uh, I'm working a lot on uh, um, oceanographic modeling at the moment and uh, visualization. Um, Laplacian transport in ocean and that kind of things with open source uh, tools and Python. Great. And finally, one random fact for the uh, for the audience. Um, yeah, uh, I love the ocean and I love surfing and diving. So cool. That's it. So with that, the floor is yours for the next five minutes to present your lightning talk, and I will join you at the end. Okay. So I will share my screen. Um, excuse me. Okay, that's that should be it. So, yeah, I, I tried to find a, a catchy title. So, um, I'm gonna show you a little bit of uh, where I come from because I used to be, a, you know, fully a geoscientist and now I'm more of a, a environmental. I don't know, um, scientists, activists, and how open source can help um, with that, or how to be a Jedi. So basically, uh, I'm based on a very small village at the very northwest tip of Scotland. It's called Durness, close to Cape Wrath. There is nearly nothing except plastic. And if you want to become a Jedi, I, I didn't lie, you can see Luke Skywalker is somewhere there. But it's more of a Mandalorian uh, approach uh, we are facing with um, plastic pollution in this area. So there is more than 40 years of, of pollution, <coughs> mainly from industrial activities at sea. And we, we know that there is more pollution to come. And also we know that uh, they are involved with uh, um, serious problems in human populations and uh, also, of course, with animals and the way the whole trophic chain is affected by, by that. So, <clears throat> some of the little things I've started to, to do, and uh, DC help, help me <laughs> correcting this a bit, uh, there are um, kind of projections are about what will happen in the future in my area and in the world. So on the left, I've just done a, a simple projection using the what um, some companies uh, offered uh, in terms of increase of production of plastic in the world. And uh, these are simulations of, um, of um, or what do you call that, of the stock of plastic which is on uh, local beaches. So you see <coughs> uh, in, at, in 2050, depending of uh, different scenarios of what we are trying to do us on the ground, each beach will have about 100 tons of plastic uh, in the sand and on the surface, more or less. So these simulations, they, they need to be corrected, and uh, uh, you, can, you can find uh, <coughs> these on my, on my repo. So the main reason why uh, there is a large increase is that you know that there is a, an excess of uh, shale gas produced, and uh, if you want to, and there were massive investments, so to pay your to to pay the banks, I mean you have to make something with the gas, and and mostly it's single-use plastic, which seems to be the strategy today. So, <clears throat> as a data scientist, uh, um, you the approach you can have also is to kind of uh, uh, gather the data people accumulate, and I, I realized very quickly that a lot of people uh, do a lot of work for nothing without saying anything, and they they clean their coastline, and so I made a this little tool online which allows you to <coughs> to map how much is collected and it's uh, it's easy to, to to use but it should be easier to use and uh, um, I think uh, the, it's all made in uh, in uh, JavaScript and I would really like uh, to have it more complex with uh, uh, Streamlight or something like that. Um, as a geoscientist also uh, I quickly realized that uh, we didn't know much about the depositional uh, system, which is associated with uh, plastic. Uh, I've heard, you know, that the plastic floats in the ocean and then arrives on the coast and all things. But it's actually uh, very complicated. Um, 
some plastic floats, some plastic uh, are denser than uh, seawater. They transported the <coughs> uh, on the seafloor during storms. Or, and here I've, I've uh, discovered in our area, there is like a sort of a four day cycle. When there is a storm, the, the baseline is really low and a lot of plastic is deposited. And when the profile of the beach uh, reestablished in four days, it traps plastic. So, and this is a, <coughs> a cycle, uh, a positive feedback cycle. So there is more and more accumulation of plastic. There, is, there are things with winds and uh, the polar plots are actually a calendar. So it's January, uh, February, etc. Uh, to December. So you can see where the, the plastic pollution occur. Um, on the lower left, this is a hydrodynamic uh, models we are trying to develop with uh, open source tools. Um, at the moment, our base is in Fortran with a code called Telemac. It's pretty difficult to, uh, to use. But uh, I'm trying to uh, include some uh, Python for uh, the particle transport, which is the plastic itself, because it's more flexible. Basically, <coughs> there is a real lack of sedimentological and oceanographic data. Um, yeah, you have the you can see uh, plastic accumulating in, in sand dunes or on the coastline, and uh, these are unaccounted for in the publications. Very quickly. Right. Yeah, I'm too long. <laughs> okay, just open hardware and a bit of uh, simulations, and that's it. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna pack here. Great. Well, thanks for uh, thanks for an interesting talk. I think once again we got a bit of feedback. So. Okay. Um, so if you'd like to stop sharing, I'm going to move on to our next speaker who has just joined us uh, in the waiting room. Yeah, it is, I think there's a lot of positive uh, buzz about Julian's talk. Um, I, I can see you probably need someone who knows Streamlight, so Software Underground take the reins. Um, Justin, welcome to the stage, coming back from uh, last year's lightning talks. So... You are currently muted, so I'm going to ask you the first question to get things underway, and that's how long have you been in the software underground now? Um, I think I shared the wrong screen because I'm seeing infinite screens. So. Yeah, yeah um, the infinite Slack, so you just need to stop sharing and reshare. But I think it's uh, in the other tab. It looks like more visible connections. Yeah, let me try that again. Sure. Um, actually, maybe it was this one. I just need to. Uh, can you see see my slides now? Yes, uh, we can see your slides now. Okay. Yeah. So, I've been in Swung since like 2015, probably. Cool. And uh, well, what do you what have you been uh, enjoying this week at Transform? Uh, so, so I've actually um, been uh, busy with um, work stuff. Um, getting um, busy at the same time, unfortunately. But I did um, catch um, some of the lightning talks and a bit on. Um, geothermal stuff so that was cool cool and before you i hand over to you for your presentation do you have one random fact you'd like to share uh yeah sure so um random fact um um the the only um computer um science course i've I've um, taken um, was on um, c um, computer art. So you're you so you're a Mr. Viz then. Anyway, I will hand over to you for your five minute lightning talk and see you at the end. Okay. So with that, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, yeah. So I'd like to uh, talk 
today about um making um more um visible connections between um um co projects and um data projects and how um th that can um um str strengthen um come unity um um and in particular um making very easy simple connections between um open data sets and um open code so um <laughs> you you've heard of developer tools before things like um ides um github etc and um there's tools for um um doing um the developer um we relations for a project um, or a tool, things like Twitter, Discord, etc. Um, but there's also um, tools for um, building up um, communities um, across a large number of um, projects too. And so like um, tra tra Transform is a uh, great example of this and um i'm gonna um suggest um one more thing that people could do which i think is um very um easy to do um but i think it has a lot of value potentially so um if you're like um skeptical of this idea um, a um, great uh, proof point of it um, working in practice is the Dawson um, Geoscience List, which um, um, has um, over um, 700 stars and um, 50 contributors. And I've um, talked to um, a bunch of people um to have said it's um um to help them find um useful uh projects and um shorten their time to get started so um now let's talk about uh, um making easy simple connections between open data sets and open code so um i have a hypothesis that it would save time save people a ton of time um, if they could easily find code already written for a um, open data set that they think might be good for them, but they don't know 100% yet. Um, and um, a second part of this hypothesis is that uh, the technology to to um, do this um, has already exists and it has existed for a while, but the culture to do it just doesn't exist yet. And part of the reason I said the culture doesn't exist is that um, typically um, data set um, owners um, are not the same people as um, code owners. And so um, even um, big um, catalogs of data or code are done by different groups. Um, and they're um, constrained in say, uh, different ways as well. Um, so, um, um, for example, um, I mean, a lot of um, open data sites are done by um, um, government or some sort of big business. And so they're likely prohibited from linking to um, outside code projects that use those um, data sets um, by rules that prohibit any apparent uh, any appearance of um, in endorsement. And also uh, um, um, in, term of, in terms of code projects, linking their code back to the um, da data sets, um, that there's a variety of project uh, problems that prevent that from um, working well. The main one is um, um, even if a code author wants to do that, they all decide to do it in a slightly different way. So there's no way to do it over a large number of code projects. Everyone does it in a different way.
So Swung deals with both open data sets and open code. So it has um, um, less um, constraints on it than s some of the other um, people and organizations in the space. And that potentially has a lot of value. So uh, my very small proposal is to add uh, data um, underground um, topic tags to your code repositories that use data from data, data um, underground. And so if you're on um, um, GitHub, you go to your about section um, in the upper right corner, you click on this little icon here, you, there's the topics thing, you put in data um, on the ground and that's it. That's all you have to do. And then um, you can see all the different code projects then that um, 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 show you how to use data from that site. So, um, ta-da, it's done. That's how you do it. But um, I'm gonna skip these slides. Um, and so there's benefits for developers, um, data um, owners and code owners. Um, so the next question, of course, you have is why is no one doing this already? Um, the short answer is that um, there's no cultural um, expectation to do it yet, um, but there could be. Um, I mean, uh, you could do it too. And I think my five minutes are up. Yep. Um, that's, that, that's your time, I'm afraid, Justin. Of course, your slides are available on Observable. The link is in the T21 general chat. And yeah, I encourage you to uh, to attend the talk in two hours, um, the hackathon debrief that Justin will be giving. But thanks for joining us again this year. It's always a pleasure to hear your ideas and to have these slides that are always shareable and interactive. So we'll be moving to our next speaker, uh, Mike, who is just waiting in the wings. Hopefully, uh, you're currently sharing your screen, Mike. So, Can you guys hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Um, how are you today? <laughs> I'm great. Thank Good. you. Thank you for uh, volunteering. I I just need to jump on and share my screen. Yeah. I don't want to share this one. I'll, I apologize uh, right off the bat in saying that um, my uh, talk is a little different than the others, I suppose. Um, I'm not going to be presenting any snippets or uh, bits of code or anything like that. Um, I just thought I'd start out with kind of who I am and why I'm here. Um, my name is Mike Mingle Davis. I currently work with a company called Kirkwood Oil and Gas. It's an LLC in Casper, Wyoming. Uh, we're an oil and gas operator in about five Rocky states. Um, uh, we engage in gold mining in Nevada, Bitcoin mining, and I have experience in a wide swath of different geological type uh, environments. Currently, we're working more in CO2, helium, and miscellaneous. And uh, to kind of get to the point of why I'm uh, here is I'm a volunteer, chronic volunteer. Um, one of the things that I'm very much concerned and involved with is what I, what's called economic empowerment. And that's making sure and helping individuals who are kind of to level the playing field, I guess, as it were, um, for people that may or may not have access to software or the ability to continue to do the work that they would be doing um, should they be employed by one of the majors or a company that's able to foot the bill for software and software packages. And so right now, uh, I am the Vice President of the Energy Minerals Division of the AAPG. Um, I got involved with them as a Rockies Mount, Rocky Mountain Counselor about, I'd say, three years ago. And during that time, my job as the counselor was to engage the Rockies 
uh, associations and kind of bring them up to speed with regard to what AAPG was doing. Um, that was right around the time when the, the pandemic hit. And as a result, when we'd go around the room or around on the uh, computer, we would hear stories about basically what was going on in these different regions globally. And essentially, everything was going to pieces. People were, of course, out of work. People didn't, uh, didn't have gainful employment. They didn't know what they were going to do. Um, AAPG itself was sort of addressing what they were going to do due to the lack of conferences. How are they going to continue to make, make money? Um, I saw a desperate need for assistance for the unemployed or undervalued scientists. And also with the pandemic, there was a slingshot to virtual conferences. Everybody was experimenting with them. Kind of, that's how I got involved here with Software Underground. I was invited by Matt, Matt Bellabradic to come and kind of check out what you guys were doing. Um, I noticed there was an increased access to data, people, collaboration, and I thought there had to be a way to kind of get all that together and allow scientists and geoscientists to become more active, at least partially, so that they can retain their, their kind of feet in the water when it comes to what we're doing geologically. And there were a couple of problems. And like I said, uh, program platform accessibility. Um, when you lose your job, you don't have Petra, you don't have Geographics, you don't have uh, Petrel. So I started engaging in freeware packages and freeware platforms that were available um, and doing what, what we called uh, freeware for freelancers, no cost presentations to show geoscientists robust, large platforms like QGIS, um, uh, what's another, Open Tech, um, QCAD and several other packages that they could use in lieu of the stuff that they basically lost when they lost their jobs. And as a kind of side to that, also to data availability. So where they can get the data, how they use these packages so they can do meaningful work. And so I guess in conclusion, because I know I only have like five minutes, um, the reason why I'm doing this lightning talk is that I would like to see AAPG take a more active role, at least the energy minerals division portion, which is the items like tight oil, uh, critical minerals, uranium, um, hard rock mining, um, a lot of different variables. Um, I'd like to use the EMD platform to engage scientists, so provide a new directive to the counselors so that they could engage the local areas that they're responsible for, find out what, what the status is there, and, and leverage these freeware platforms, um, essentially creating, like I write on the slide here, creating a network of specialized scientists, taking those, that network and using it to address real-world problems that exist in these smaller areas that these counselors are responsible for. And hopefully through that, each of us can sort of throw in a little bit of knowledge, do a little bit of work and address real world problems that exist in these smaller scale areas, essentially providing a solution to some problem and then just laying it on their desk and, and walking away. Um, you guys fit in this because your, uh, your work is integral. I mean, the stuff that you guys are doing is amazing. I feel very grateful to be invited to this conference. I think it, it's it's amazing. And hopefully the next step after getting everybody used to these freeware platforms is to get them engaged in some more of these snippet types of things and, and bits of code that you guys are working on. And that's that's all I really have to say today. <laughs> great. No, I gave a very similar talk last year to kick the lightning talks off. It's always great to hear personal opinions in this session but thanks for joining us and i notice in the chat especially a lot of people are very happy to see some you know the established societies taking a bit of interest in swung and coming out here with swinging effectively so i think you've kicked off some great discussion um thanks for 
yeah, thanks for joining us in a great presentation. I hope you enjoy the rest of Transform. It's amazing. Uh, keep keep up the great work. You yeah. guys are amazing, and it's uh, I it's going to take forever to digest what you guys have been doing over the last few days. You got to unwind it. It's going to take I don't know months. So um, thank you so much. I appreciate it, and stay in touch. Yeah, no, and feel free. We'll invite. We're always welcome back for any talks. Cool. Right. So. We've got a few minutes before I'm going to introduce our next speaker, so I'm going to take this opportunity to share my screen. Screen one. Allow. And I'm going to introduce you to some merch because we all love coding, we all love transform, we all love tutorials, but do you know what we all really love is looking good doing it. With these lovely t-shirts designed by the Software Underground, you can uh, do that. Uh, as you can see, there's editions for everyone. There's the geek edition. There's this regular fetching black edition. You can be the envy of your virtual communities. And they're only available for a limited time during Transform. And of course, if you want to donate for the registration, there's an option there. And we have the classic Transform mug. Uh, software Underground sticker packs and the Rocks Code and Model T-shirt that I've seen several people modeling this week. I have one myself. I know Artash is wearing his. Uh, they're really good. It, it looks good all year round. Washes up great. Very easy to maintain. Uh, and yeah, so don't forget to get your swag. And that leads me nicely into our next speaker, a man who who knows his swag well and has been in the Software Underground for quite a while, Mr. Steve Purvis. So Steve, if you'd like to uh, come in and tell us about the swag you're currently wearing. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Yeah, I've got the uh, Heinz 52 Varieties of Open Source t-shirt, which is one of the only t-shirts that comes in fetching burgundy, by the way, which is a favorite. I can't be in black all the time. So it's Worcestershire sauce, is it? Uh, I think that's the burgundy in the crisp packet color spectrum. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, you know your Chris Packers. <laughs> Good. Well, Steve, do you, do you want to put an estimate on how long you've been in the software underground now, or do you want to... I actually uh... went and checked, because you can, you can dive in there. So it was uh, August 2015 when I, when I first joined up. Cool. And this what's this week held for you, or what have you been excited by in the big, big universe of software underground? Uh, all the things going on. I think great. I spent. I was still spending a lot of time uh, preparing my talk, the, the Git tutorial, and a few people were trying to use uh, the app that we're building, and uh, I spent a lot of time making that work better. <laughs> so this right. week has been a lot of running around with performance problems and bug fixing for me, and it's been yeah. good to dip in and out of the hackathon stuff. I really like the Gather Shuttle and being able to dip in and out. Yeah, so I guess uh, even though I'm not yeah. fully in the hack. So, so I guess you were here last year as well. And if you've seen the evolution, uh, Matt and I were talking about this before the session that you know the kind of transforms taking on its own consciousness at the moment. We kind of feel like it's with the people. Do you think that's true, or you know, what's your what's your feeling year on year? I don't know. It's because this year has been always on anyway and always online, and I think. Uh, this year, it's uh, it's still a lot of stuff going on, but it's it seems less of a change. It fits in, I don't know. It fits in more to my day to day. So cool. I don't know. Last year, I seemed a, a, a big because everybody was uh, just on the edge of COVID. There's a tiny mm -hmm. big change, so it, it felt a lot different last year. Yeah. yeah. Somehow, I've ended up with the same haircut as last year. I've just managed to trim trim my fantastic beard down to. Uh, this was actually an accident. I set the trimmer to the wrong length last weekend, so I was trying to re trying to regrow it. But anyway, enough random facts from me. One random fact from you, Steve, and then you can kick off your uh, lightning talk. Yeah. Oh, okay. My thing. My COVID positive was that I started running a year ago, and a random fact is that if you're into running. Uh, Software Underground has a running channel called Runderground. So if you're a runner, go and find that and join in. That's, uh, that's pretty funny because there was a running club at the very first transform around the chateau and us uh, less uh, running inclined people sat around eating cheese and drinking beer while they did it. Anyway, Steve, you I'm, have five minutes. On. Yes. You okay. have five minutes and I'll see you at the end. Great. 
Well, thanks. So what I'd like to talk about was I gave a talk uh, yesterday on uh, version control for scientists, which I was, uh, I guess, over-optimistic about the amount of material I'd be, uh, I was able to cover. So I covered about half of the material yesterday during the uh, tutorial. And uh, that was mainly focused on Git and GitHub. But I just wanted to use this lightning talk and the next one in about half an hour's time to highlight the other two bits, which I didn't get to in the tutorial. And uh, what I did this morning was I actually went and recorded those two extra bits as videos. Uh, so they're available to us. And uh, basically, those two bits look at curve note and uh, DVC. And in those videos, I go through setting something up in Curve Note and getting something versioned in Curve Note and getting some data versioned in DVC as well. And what I wanted to do with this slot is just explain why and maybe have a look at maybe now what we can do with it. So why all these different version control systems? Uh, basically, Git isn't good enough to do everything we needed to do. Git is really good at code and plain text versioning and works well. And it turns out there are other version control systems one called DVC, which is focused on machine learning pipelines, et cetera, but also does uh, data versioning very well. And uh, there's another uh, platform that I'm building out with, uh, with Rowan, and that's called Curve Note. And what that does is that does notebook and uh, paper versioning really well. And the interesting thing is these two things can be tied together by Git, because you use Git to uh, store the metadata for both of the others. So without too much, I don't want to take up too much time, but that's it. And with this, we can build the reproducible workflow from data to paper, maybe. And that's what we're, we're, we're trying out here. So in my tutorial, I got us into a state where we have this versioned from data to paper, as it were. And I'm going to have a look now with DVC. So obviously, on my local machine, I've got everything set up here. I've got a local repo with my uh, seismic notebook in it. Locally, I have a data folder inside my Git repo with a 50 megabyte segwi file. And that file is uh, not actually in Git. All the information about that file is in Git, but the file itself is being versioned by DVC and is actually connected up to my Google Drive. So DVC, I give DVC access to my repo on Google Drive, and it is storing versions of my SegWi data on my Google Drive, but keeping it all linked in to my uh, Git repo. So let's quickly flip over to a completely different environment. So this is a Saturn cloud somewhere off on somebody else's computer, Jupyter Lab running. And I've already been in here, and I have, uh, in a terminal, I have uh, Cloned the GitHub repo. I have uh, installed my Condor environment, and I have built a kernel for my uh, notebook. I have also installed uh, DVC. Maybe. Ah, no. Uh, Condor activate SEG tutorial fade. I have also installed, yes, installed BBC on there. So now I go to my Jupyter Hub where, uh, or remote Jupyter instance in the cloud where normally I don't have access to my data or it's a bit fiddly to get my data there, or it's definitely a question of how do I get my data on here? And if I run the cell now, we get an error because I can't load my SegWi file because it's not here. Hopefully now, uh, where am I? I'm in project. I can uh, CD into T21 science notebook. Uh, sorry, let me boost the font. And hopefully, I can just do DVC pool. Ah, let's see if there's time. Pip install DVC G drive. Missing dependency. Can I find a version? Darn, darn. <laughs> uh, so, is that, do you think that's right? 
Any help in the channel there? What's that? What's that? Ah, that's a weird <laughs> package name. Do I have more time, Dan? Or am I Unfortunately, wrong? Steve, you have uh, have just run out of time. Um, well, come back in about we, we forty do, minutes. We do have five, we do have five I've minutes got, until the next speaker's due to start. So. That's okay though, because I tell you what, when my next lightning slot is in about forty minutes. Yep. And I will continue this and pick up with my data set locally and show you the rest of this reproducible workflow. Yeah, um, don't, don't, don't forget as well, CurveNote is available to register and sign up on. So do grab your software underground usernames over there. And um, yeah, it's really cool what Steve and Rowan have been building. So do uh, do feel free to work with them. But thanks for getting things started, Steve. I know firsthand the perils of uh, live demos. So um, we'll, we'll pick this up uh, at, when are you? You're at half past the next hour. Yes, I think it's actually going to work too. So I will see you in half an hour. Great. So, so we have Jesse here waiting in the wings. So if you'd like to uh, come off mute, switch your camera on and join me on the virtual stage. How are you today? Doing well. How about yourself? Good. You know, it's always always fun to be chairing these. It's nice to have you back for another year as well. Yeah. Uh, so how long have you been with us now in the Software Underground uh, that's a good question. So I had to look it up. I knew it was in uh, 2017, at, 2017 at some point. And uh, so it was July 2017. I joined uh, joined the Slack channel. Great. Have you managed to catch much of Transform this week? Or have you been working on something else that's been exciting you? What's 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 the buzz for you around, <laughs> around the, these days? Yeah, so it's been, uh, this is the probably the busiest week of my spring semester. Um, so I've been meeting with students a lot this week. We've got five kind of new and interesting projects that uh, that my freshmen are working on. We've got a group doing uh, reinforcement learning and placing EV chargers uh, based on power demand. So that's kind of cool. Um, I've got two groups working on denoising images with uh, generative networks. Um, I've got another group that's working on building out a kind of new stack GAN architecture. And then uh, my last group is building a recommender system to recommend oil and gas wells uh, to companies. So kind of uh, a wide variety of stuff, but that's kind of what we've been up to. So uh, some cool things coming soon. Yeah, it's, uh, that's, a, that's quite the stack, um, very ambitious. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And before you're gonna say, oh, I've got one notebook, you know, I've been doing this, but no, just, just, just reinventing everything from the ground. <laughs> Yeah. Great. So, um, yeah, one random fact then, and then the virtual floor will be yours for five minutes. Perfect. Um, random fact. I thought about this one. Um, and my random fact is that for about a year and a half, um, I traveled around uh, the state of Alaska in a 1973 VW bus. Awesome. So kind of a random one. <laughs> I'm sure there's going to be questions about that in the chateau later. Great. I'd like to start sharing. The floor is yours for the next five minutes, and then I will pop in at the end. Perfect. And I assume you can see my screen. If not, just shout at me. Yeah. Predicting alphabet soup. Great title. Perfect. All right. All right. So today I'm going to talk about one of the projects that we're kind of wrapping up, uh, predicting alphabet soup. Um, so I've got a little alphabet soup in the background here um, for your viewing pleasure. All right, so let's talk about well mnemonics. So well mnemonics in a nutshell is alphabet soup. I've heard many people refer to it this way. Um, if you're sitting there thinking maybe it's not that bad, um, let's zoom into my background from my opening slide and uh, I, I beg to differ. So. Well log mnemonics can be kind of a, a nightmare to deal with. So what we really kind of took on with our project that I'm talking about today is we wanted to figure out how to organize our alphabet soup, how to make predictions on alphabet soup. So we built a package. Um, it's on GitHub. It's in Python, obviously, um, to alias well log mnemonics to help us sort through this alphabet soup. It's got three main components. It's got a dictionary search, a keyword extractor. They take care of like 80% of our mnemonics. And then we built in an AI because 
AI is so hot right now. So our AI that we built takes about 20% of our, uh, our use cases. So you're probably asking yourself, what does this magical AI do? So our AI, in a nutshell, reads the curve descriptions, returns human readable two word summaries. So we're not creating more alphabet soup. And it's really useful for on edge cases, kind of strange descriptions. Um, you might notice our asterisk, our AI is a recurrent neural network with attention. You might see that and think, oh, they're using transformers, which kind of, um, we're using less of kind of full-fledged transformers and more like a kind of a baby transformer almost. Um, instead of transformer architecture, we're just using a recurrent neural network. So what did we do with this thing? Well, we let it run rampant on about 300,000 curve descriptions. This included mud logs, log, um, drilling logs, deviation surveys, any kind of weird LAS files that we could get our hands on. We turn the confidence all the way down for our um, neural network. And then we turned off our dictionary, so our lookup table, and our keyword extractor assist. We said, no free lunch for this thing. How is it going to do? How is it going to stack up? And let's go through how it stacked up. Well, we ran it on these 300,000 curve descriptions. And some of the good results, you know, it told us that some curves were spectral gamma, picked out caliper, all our resistivity logs, gamma ray. So it did a pretty good job with, um, with a lot of these things. Kind of the bad things, um, you know, some of the descriptions are, have interesting things in them. So our neural network tried its best um, to give us a good description. Some of them weren't so great. We had gamma B, kind of these weird, um, summaries. And then some of the ugly ones um, are my personal favorites. My favorite is got to be water porosity and whole hole. So those are some of the uglier ones. Um, so it does good. It does pretty well with some things and that kind of struggles with other things. If we look at it in kind of a graph form, here's what it looks like. It really, really, really likes to call everything spectral gamma for some reason. Um, so we had 800 mnemonics aliased into spectral camera. Um, other ones, you know, in our kind of top 50 picks, it, you know, they're pretty reasonable. Some are a little more um, out there, like far porosity, um, you know, medium, and then kind of some ASCII character that was in there. So it does all right. Um, but this was mostly just to see what is this thing doing? How does it function? Um, how does it work without our keyword extractor and uh, dictionary assist? So the key thing for this that I want to get across today is put this thing to work. You know, try it out for all your well log aliasing needs. It plays nicely with Welly. Um, it plays well with LASIO. You can load in custom lookup tables, both uh, JSON, CSV. Uh, you can plot out confidence heat maps on the alias confidence or yeah, the alias confidence. Um, you can enti alias entire di directories at once. You can do single files. Um, you've got a lot of different options of how you want to mix and match this thing. Download it. Come chat with us on GitHub. We would love feedback, um, and we would love to see this in use. And with that, thank you all for your time. Uh, thank you for a very entertaining five minutes. Um, I've, I've shared, yeah, awesome pop culture references. I think that's the consensus, but I've shared the link in the chat. I'm going to try this tool out because I used to have to do this manually when I was uh, at a service company starting my career. I had this big CSV of well mnemonics. So it was, you know, V lookup tables and all that rubbish. So it's great. Um, yeah. But uh, thanks for sharing and yeah, enjoy the rest of the conference. And everyone, please do check out the repo and give it a whirl. But, uh, Definitely. Right. Thank you much. Thanks a lot. Cool. Well, yeah, we're about midway through the talks now. We've got some great stuff coming up, including part two of Steve's talk. Uh, it's probably too early for another merch plug, but just a reminder that merch is available all week. I'm sure if you ask Matt nicely, he might be able to sign some. Uh, I don't think it costs extra. But um, 
Yeah, so next up on our talks is uh, Lucia Perez Diaz, who is waiting in the wing. So if you'd like to come off mute, share your camera, we can get things kicked off. Welcome Thanks. to the Lightning Talks today. How are you doing? I'm all right. How are you? Good. Yeah, it's uh, it's been a good 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 day and a half so far. Um, awesome. So we got we just got a few minutes to fill before your start. So I'm just going to ask you the standard questions and then be your opportunity to talk for five minutes. So how long have you been with the Software Underground now? Um, three hours. Uh, <laughs> so I was saying to Matt earlier, I've, I've followed you for a long time, but I had not brought myself to join the Slack yet because I'm in something like seven different Slack groups at the minute. <laughs> and so I just couldn't bring myself to it, but I have now. I have now. So there you go. Great. So, uh, yeah, I think this is a common thing, Matt, roping people in from various, uh, in a good way, Matt, from various different channels of the world and uh, to work on stuff. So what, what have you been sort of up to that's brought you into the software underground then? Uh, well, I'm so I'm a plate modeler, so I do a lot of uh, reconstructing past plate motions. So I do a fair bit of uh, programming here and there no no expert by any means uh but i'm sure there's gonna be stuff in software underground that i find useful or i'll just be asking all the questions and not actually not actually answering very many but there we go cool um so where in the world are you based at the moment um, the uk i'm UK, in oxford right? near oxford. oxford right yeah all right cool all right so one do you have one random fact you'd like to share with everyone before we move into the um yeah sure um i'm a freelance illustrator so uh if you don't see me talking about geology most of the time i'm doing something that involves either graphic design or illustration or that kind of thing awesome so if you'd like to start sharing um i will give you your five minutes once the screen is live and join at the again at the and okay okay can you see that yes okay uh, i can see that so, so um i'm starting with a tweet uh, because that's how all the good things start right so um maybe my lightning talk is a bit of a different topic today uh, but a, a few months ago i started getting really annoyed i guess it really goes back a few years really annoyed with the current publishing culture that we have where you know, we have all these metrics and they're taken to mean certain things. And we have all these journals that uh, charge us money for publishing. They charge us money for reading papers. Um, and so after this tweet, which is a, just me, a bit of a rant, um, I, I, I thought, um, OK, well, I saw Steve Hicks was talking about a diamond open access uh, journal starting for seismologists. And I just threw the tweet out like, you know, I'm in tectonic structural geology. Uh, should we also try to launch a journal uh, and join these other groups that are talking about the same and starting to talk about maybe doing something about changing the publishing culture? Um, had some people jump on board. Um, and uh, this is kind of where we are right now. Um, it's uh, been a few months. So to give you a bit of background, some of you might know about Volcanica. Volcanica is a diamond open access journal that's been running now for a few years. Uh, diamond open access means that there is no uh, fees for anyone. It's free to publish in and it's free to read. And I guess they are the ones really that that deserve the shout out because I think they inspired us all to say, yes, this is great. Let's do this for other disciplines. So Tectonica, which is the one I'm most involved in, uh, Seismica and Sedimentologica are now in their infancies. We are in the process of building these journals um, with the aim to launch them at the end of, sorry, at the beginning of next year. So at the end of this year, uh, beginning of 2022. Um, the reasons why we're doing this, that's like a, a bit of text there um, that you can read yourselves, but the reasons why we're doing this is, is mainly because a lot of us are very frustrated with how science publishing works at the minute and with having all these barriers to access science, uh, all the paywalls and such. So even if you're trying to read science, you have to pay. Um, not everybody can afford to publish. There's people in lots of various career situations that mean that you might be sitting on research that you can't publish. So we're kind of doing what makes sense to do. You know, we have now this growing culture of preprints. So we're going one step further and saying, okay, let's expand this to actual, um, you know, an actual publisher, if you like, 
that doesn't charge anybody. Um, so my main message today here is if this resonates with you, if you also want to see a change in the publishing landscape, uh, best thing to start with is coming along. If you're going to EGU next week, uh, coming along to these sessions, this is the top one is a, is a session like with presentations. The second one is a social we're running for Tectonica on Gather. So you can listen to what various people talk about there. So we have people from Tectonica, from Seismica, from Volcanica. Um, and if you want to get involved in, in helping us make it happen, then as well as following us on Twitter, you can send us a message either on Twitter or uh, on email and ask, ask us to put you into our Slack groups uh, where we have relatively big teams of people uh, doing everything from website development uh, to discussing journal structure to writing uh, guidelines for the journals, like a range of things. So don't think I'm asking you to come on board as editors and reviewers. We're one step before that. So we're actually uh, building these journals from the ground up. Um, so yeah, I hope some of you get involved. And if you don't want to get too involved because you have too much going on, that's fine. Just follow us on Twitter, retweet us, just give us a bit of visibility if you can. That helps. Um, so yeah, just get involved as, as much or as little as, as you can. And, and please submit papers when we're up and running next year. So, yeah. That's it, I think. Cool. Um, we had a few. We're having a few questions coming through in the chat. I don't know if you can quickly share um, the screen, maybe the Volcanica or Tectonica website. Maybe show us a bit yeah. of what the journal looks like. We're running a little ahead of schedule, so we're going to give you a bit more uh, time to show off because this is really cool and it's really cool. Let well. me... So yeah, this is Volcanica. So they've been running for a couple of years now. And you can see their volumes and uh, read their papers. Um, uh, we, I can't really show you the Tectonica website yet. Uh, if you come into the Slack group, then you can test it and you can help us test it. So that would be pretty cool. Um, you could be part of the technical team, even moving forward. Uh, we need all kinds of skills. And I should have said um, two things. One is that this is not my initiative. I did. I was the person that just sent a tweet out once and said, hey, let's do this. But it's it's big groups of people. Um, and two, none of us know what we're doing. So if you're kind of holding back, thinking, oh, I don't know if I want to join this because I don't know if I can add very much. If you publish science, if you write science, if like there will be something you can contribute, even if it's just to the discussion. You know, we had really interesting discussions about what should peer review be like, where people are just sharing their experience of peer review and what works and what doesn't work. And so, yeah, don't 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 hold back just because you feel you don't have the right expertise. Um, we none of us know what we're doing. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I've stolen this line from Matt many times, the law of two feet, jump right into whatever. It doesn't matter your experience. The main question in the chat now is, how do we join your Slack? Um, it, do, you, do you have a link that you want to share? Do you uh, want to put, you know, what's the what's the joining procedure? Yeah, so um, I, I'm going to give you the, the official procedure, which is to, uh, for Tectonica and for Sismica, um, you just send them an email and I can uh, drop the links somewhere, I'm sure, um, where I can just go back to my screen where I show them. If you find them on Twitter, the links are, uh, the sorry, the email addresses are also there. That's the official way because then they'll tell you what to do. We're trying to collect information about who is joining, what's their expertise, essentially so that down the line, we can have a look through that database and be like, hmm, I'm gonna identify a couple of people to help me with a specific thing. Uh, so then we can go knocking on your door. Um, Otherwise, you can message me um, and I'll get you into Slack. Uh, or you can message Steve Hicks or uh, Martin at Sismica. Um, yeah, just get get in touch. Get in touch with me and I'll and I'll uh, I'll get you in there. Great. I think you're gonna be inundated with people who want to help with everything. That's okay, that's fine. Like the only thing like I'm trying to say now is start saying, not to put people off, but is if you come into the Slack. I would really, 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 really be glad if you did participate because we have a lot of people in Slack that just joined the Slack, but they don't they're not very vocal. And what we want is 
to have people be vocal, you know, give us feedback, tell us what you would like these journals to look like. Because uh, that for Tectonica, which is the one I'm most involved in, the core team, it's a group of six people, and we're the ones that are trying to really keep things going, keep the ball rolling. But we're not the decision makers. We don't want to be the decision makers. We want the feedback from the community. So join Slack and don't be afraid to, you know, raise your hand and say, oh, I can help with this. Even if it's a small thing, just, yeah. just don't be silent because then I have to go chasing you. And it's just such a pain. I don't think there's going to be an issue with the software underground types. No, That's cool. That's perfect. You could That's probably great. learn learn a lot from what we've learned as a community starting off small and growing. Uh, some other questions. Are you publishing primarily in English or are there other language publications? Um, our hope is to be as inclusive as possible. And this is yet again, more things that are being discussed. Uh, we want to have abstracts in various languages or we'd like to see that happen from early on. So at least the abstract being in, in various languages. Um, but yeah, it's something being discussed. We'd love to publish research in more than just English. Yeah, I think. And just one question, I think, very personal to the audience here is how broad are the scopes uh, of, of kind of the journals? Would ML, you know, the kind of data science that people in Swung are quite interested in fitting into your journals? So again, uh, we all, so all of the journals have a draft uh, scope. Again, uh, these things are being written. So things like the scope in detail that are being written up to eventually make it to the website. Uh, if you comment to Slack, you can contribute to that. From the Tectonica side, we're very aware that a lot of the research that might come to us, things like plate modeling, numerical modeling, all of this, um, there is a big component of machine learning that keeps growing and growing. So yes, I think for sure there'll be scope for it. Down the line, when these journals are more established and we've all been running for, say, four or five years, my, my hope is that we can create a bigger umbrella organization Almost like today, you have publishers that host several journals. So in the same way, having this big umbrella organization that hosts the various journals and provides the infrastructure and the means for other disciplines to join in, where you know you might say, okay, let's let's have a fifth journal that focuses on whatever it is. Um, so in the long term, it's like hopefully it'll be quite big and it'll grow and be healthy and successful. But um, for now, I think most of the journals are happy to have quite broad scopes. Fantastic. Um, we have one final question from Matt, and that's how's the funding situation for uh, your open source journals? Do you have sources of funding in place or? Uh... Yeah, so um, touch wood at the minute is not going badly. I, I had this worry at the beginning. It was like, oh, we need to make sure we have funding for uh, the long term, not just funding for a year. Um, We've had a few places that have been have responded really positively to the idea of having diamond open access journals and have uh, come and said, we'd love to support you. So at the moment, it's looking promising. Um, also keep in mind that, say, Volcanica runs on something like 500 pounds a year. So actually, 500 pounds a year, you know, if it was 50 of us launching the journal, put 10 pounds each, we could we could pay for that. So like the costs are really quite small. Um, so yeah, it's looking so far, it's looking good. I again touch wood. I don't want to jinx it, but uh, the, I think the main um, big task for all of us is finding a host institution, which again is in development, so that we have an easy way without having to set the journals up as um community i can't remember what the terminology is it's not charity but without having to set up the journals as a legal entity be able to receive funding to use that funding and so on and the easiest way to do that is to associate the journal with an institution volcanic is associated with the university of strasbourg so that's where we're going uh, with tectonic as well we're talking to universities and such Awesome. Yeah. Um, so cool. Well, we're now back on schedule, so I'm going to let you go. But thanks for the extra cool. questions That's and everything. Fine. And I, I yeah. think people in, you know, this is the kind of thing the software underground people love. So expect uh, some some real yeah, get, get involved. So cool. thanks, yeah. thanks, thanks for making the time this afternoon. Oh, That's all right. Thanks for inviting me. No problem. Cool. So we are now back on schedule. And guys, please do check out the journal. Uh, joining us now is uh, Valentin. <laughs> Hey, Dan. How are you doing today, sir? Very fine in you. 
Yeah, not too bad. I'm just going to ask you a few questions before we kick off. So, of course, the classic, how long have you been involved with the software underground? Uh, now it's close to three years. Three years. So you were at the very first uh, Transformer, if I remember. Yes, exactly. Going back to the chateau. And have you been? Uh, what have you been up to this week in Transform? Have you had a chance to catch parts of it, all of it, some of it? No, sadly, I'm really working hard on a seismic project. So no, <laughs> not really time to to follow. I can try you... to to catch up in the evening, but anyway. <laughs> can you tell us more about this seismic project or uh, something Yeah, else? it's a complex 3D project in in Geneva, in fact. But we are involved in the. In fact, I'm developing a web app of course, in Python Django uh, to coordinate from the field QC to the project supervisions. Cool. Yeah. Cool. And do you have one random fact you'd like to share with the group before you begin your presentation? Yeah. Just let people know that the Swiss are crazy enough to have refu uh, to refuse an additional week of holiday by voting 75% no. <laughs> So you voted for an extra week of work instead of an extra week week of rest. Yes, we are crazy. <laughs> well, if you'd like to uh, start sharing your screen, I'll hand over to you yes. for the five minutes and join you at the end for some questions. I think we'll keep. If you have any questions, please keep them coming in the chat, and we'll ask them if we as we have time after the speakers. Do you see my short. screen? Yep. Yeah, perfect. So I'm going to quickly introduce a seismic viewer that we have released recently. Uh, just to, yeah, why does it? Hey. So just a quick context. Uh, I work for a Swiss company uh, that is now 20 years old nearly. Uh, we worked worldwide on applied geophysics. It was really multi methods, but now we are more and more focusing on 3D and 2D and 3D land seismic surveys. Uh, first for oil and gas and now, obviously, for more and more geothermal exploration. Uh, why we did this too? Uh, many of us, I think, have encountered the challenge to display seismic data to, to be able to do a, field, a quick QC on the field with the client or internal stuff without firing heavy software or having to code or script. Uh, you all know that most of us code a bit, but most of the geophysicists do not, sadly, maybe sadly. And there is a need to, to have an executable software to, to do this. There was a software, which is called SACI, that we used for some years, but it's not maintained anymore. And we have decided to, in fact, uh, shift our in-house tool to a publicly released one. And hopefully it might interest some of you. We'll see. You will see if it interests. Uh, how we did it. So we just released it version one in early April, so three weeks ago. It is for once not in Python, but in C Sharp. Uh, it's not, I did not develop it, it's a colleague of mine. Um, it works in memory, so it's the file size that you can work with is limited by your RAM on your laptop or workstation. Uh, so it, that cannot work with, let's say, more than six or eight gigabytes of files. Uh, we hope to release new features two, of, two, uh, two up to four times a year, depending on our time and the schedule of our surveys. It is not an open source project, it's a free software. It will remain one. Um, maybe I can discuss this later, but since it also has a commercial part of it, uh, a marketing part, let's say, we, we it has been decided not to, to release, it, release it open source. Anyway, it's free and it will remain free. So, uh, for the seismic, seismic guys and women in the in the audience, uh, some features. I will do a live demo afterwards. Uh, the software supports two of the main standards. It's SegY and Seg2. It also supports Seismic Unix. There is plan to support SegD also. We can do basic filters, so bandpass, high cut, low cut, some spectra. Uh, to plot the other words, 
uh, inspect uh, text, trace headers, bin headers also have some gains, input, output headers, export the files at SegY, Seg2, and SU, also same thing Unix. For example, after applying filters, if you would just want to have a quick QC on the field to, to, to check the some octave bands in your in your shot gatherer or something like this. And of course, the data displays can be really easy to customize. Uh, you will have a link. I will post the, the PDF in the in the Slack channel afterwards. I will now shift to uh, try to shift to a live presentation. Uh, quick second. Yep. Uh, now, uh, can you just confirm if you if you see the seismic viewer? Yep. It's a little degraded, but we can see the seismic view. Perfect. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so. I, I have imported uh, what we call an average file. So it's a collection of 2D shot gathers, uh, Vibrose shot gathers. It was a challenging survey. So that's why maybe some of us, some of you will not really like the lack of reflection in these shots. But uh, anyway, <laughs> so just a quick overview of the software. Uh, of course, you can zoom in, zoom out, uh, change the timelines, chain display not in colors but in wiggles so the usual stuff you can play around with the gain have an hec which you can change if you want normalization or, or not etc etc so the, the basic stuff is here uh, you can have a look at the trace the section information so it's basically a summary of the headers and the trace count and the and the, the sampling, etc. You can have a, you can display if you want maybe the trace number on top to, to know exactly where you are in the shot. If you want the shot count, I don't know where it is. Field recount number. Maybe you have the rec the file number. So there is some place to to show some headers. You can plot them also if you want. Maybe have the the offset on all shots, along with the, let's say, elevation of the receiver. So you can check how the, the segue can be filled. Might be useful on a section also to check the fold or, or whatever attributes you, you might have on the on the headers. Uh, these headers can be exported as a CSV that can be directly imported in, uh, in Pandas to plot and play around. Uh, the, the other way around is possible, so you can import a CSV to fill the trace headers. Of course, uh, most of you will already know that it's easy. it can be a challenge to fill exactly or with the right formatting, but normally it works well. Um, you can also have some basic frequency, fi uh, frequency filters. So if you want maybe a band pass filter between, let's say, 25 to 60 hertz, and play around. Uh, of course, it will only display if I check the apply frequency. So this can be used if you want to extract quickly to, sh to just send to a client a shot gather with a specific filter to maybe notch the 50, classic 50 hertz from the electromagnetic or power lines. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm afraid your uh, time for this demo has run out. Uh, okay, so no worry. Are... I mean, you, I, I was finished anyway. <laughs> oh, perfect. Well, if people are interested in seeing more, more thoroughly, grab 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 our man Valentin here for uh, a beer in the chateau and uh, a walk yeah. this platform. Anyway, the software is can be downloaded on on our our um, our website. And anyway, just shout at me if you if you have any yeah. questions. So I suggest you put the link in the T21 general chat. And uh, we'll be yeah. done. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for turning up. I appreciate it. And now, as we move into the uh, toward the end of our talks, it's part two of Steve's tutorial from earlier on version control. We've solved the Python error and learned a bit about a little bit about weird Conda installs. Um, so Steve, um, we'll use. I tell you, I'll give you your preamble time to spend a little bit longer on the demo, just in case. So the floor cool. is yours. Thank you, Dan. Right. So picking up from earlier on, uh, what we were trying to do was 
we'd versioned a bunch of stuff. We'd versioned some data, code, notebook, uh, using a combination of Git, DVC, and Curve Node. We'd done that earlier yesterday, and you can check out my full tutorial if you want to know how we get to that point. And what we're doing in the Lightning talk now, and in the last one, was to go onto a completely different computer, check the repo out of Git, and then just go and try and run that notebook. Cool. So uh, here I am on the Saturn Cloud, which gives you free uh, Jupyter uh, instances up in the up in the cloud. And I've checked out the uh, repo again. I've installed DVC, and it's now all fully installed. So of course. I've checked out a repo and a, and a code base, and I don't have locally here my big seismic file. So it's a 50 meg seismic file that isn't versioned in Git, but is versioned in DVC. So now what I should be able to do, though, is because I've checked out Git, and I have this DVC metadata, this folder here and this file here, I should be able to tell DVC to go and fetch my data. Now, I actually uh, used DVC with Google Drive just to be, uh, just because that's a, a quick setup method. So it's going to go and ask me to uh, give it uh, access to everything, which is maybe a little scary. But if you're using S3 or something like that, you won't have that uh, issue. But now it gives me this code, which I paste in here. It says it's successful, and now it's downloading my seismic. And it has been stopped by Saturn Cloud. OK. So we almost got there with Saturn Cloud. Uh, I think uh, if we flip back to a local machine, it will absolutely do it here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try something again that I've never done before. Uh, I'm going to uh, remove data F3 seismic. And I'm going to do a DVC pool from here. And now hopefully this should check out and pull my data repository. So imagine that. So imagine that I've just got the notebook file and the GitHub and no data, and i am now solved the question of, well, how do I get this seismic file in to be able to reproduce this uh, notebook? And the answer is I can do that via uh, a DVC to actually pull out of any storage bucket that I like into my repo. After that, what can I do? Well, then I can come along to my, uh, run my Jupyter notebook and Jupyter lab. I now have my seismic file, so I can come in and fix this color map problem. It's a pretty slow render there. So I can come in here and do something better than this color map. Uh, change that to seismic. And then actually save that version of the notebook. Which is very slow when you've got uh, Jitsi running in Chrome at the same time. Are you still there, Dan? Yes. I'm, I'm still here. Um, Great. And yeah, what will happen? A bit of Jitsi uh, degradation as well. Do you think so? Because um, the stream quality has also dropped down. Jitsi, my learning is Jitsi doesn't like certain things when they're done live this week. I think that's uh, so okay. no, Bain's tutorial. We also had a similar problem in, with. Uh, well, I'll, instead of trying to demo it, I'll just talk about it. Uh, so what that versioning does is it pushes a version of my notebook up into the cloud so that then I get this uh, rendered view of my notebook. But more importantly, I can update and take my figures through from a notebook into the copy of my uh, 
my next paper where I can automatically update the, the, the figure from my notebook. And instead of trying to continue this live when Jitsi's not happy, I'd say uh, go back and have a look at the at the tutorial is, is one is one thing in terms of finding out how to get data and notebooks into these tools. And I think it'd be good to just, I don't know, this is always an ongoing discussion. Reproducibility is really hard and nobody's solved it yet. And we, everyone's still trying. But there, I think now there are some interesting tools coming together. And, uh, and what I find really interesting with this workflow is that uh, actually Git is stitching together the, the metadata and the hashes for the uh, the versions of your data in your notebooks, which are in other 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 systems, so it's almost like you can use a couple of different tools, and at the end of the day, everything gets packed back into your Git repo, and you do one commit there, and everything is in is in sync, uh, which I think is a really interesting way to go, especially when that goes right the way through from your data right the way through to the actual. Uh, paper and then the actual paper that you're producing and just like you do in git each element of here including your figure has like a, a hash id that is completely is completely traceable so you'll always know uh which version of the code which version of the data set was used to uh create your paper yeah I mean, this looks like a fantastic way to, for example, to scale hackathon projects where you're given a version of the data to work on, you do your hackathon project. So, and then maybe next year someone does it on a slightly different version. So you're able to kind of scale that hackathon process uh, mm -hmm. into maybe even help get hackathon projects into production a bit better. Yeah, indeed. And check out Saturn Cloud, by the way. It's something I discovered this year. Uh, it does full Dask support. And uh, I think it's well worth a, a look and a play around with, even though it seems to be blocking uh, DVC, which is yeah. Good. So maybe share a share a link to Saturn Cloud in the T Twenty One general chat. We'll um, do. Thank you. But no, thank you, Steve. Uh, two two presentations. You managed to overcome the technical challenges. But, uh, they almost worked twice. Yes. Yeah, you know, good, good enough for jazz, I guess, is the takeaway there. But um, yeah, that brings us nicely into what will be one of our last talks today from Zane, who's waiting in the wings. So if you'd like to step up to the virtual stage when you're ready, we can uh, begin to roll. I hope everyone has enjoyed the lightning talks. There's been a wide range of topics today, yesterday. You know, we've covered everything from journals to plastics in the ocean to open source coding and seism seismicity and it's linked to COVID-19 and sources. So, And I'd encourage people to try, uh, try their own lightning talks wherever they work or teach or even being educated. It's, it's a great way to get people engaged. And yeah, once again, don't forget to pick up some transform merch while you still can. It is limited. They are going to be in high demand and the envy of everyone who sees them. So do remember to check out the Swung store. Uh, with that, Zane, would you like to begin sharing if you're here? Hmm. Yes. So I guess, well, we've got a small delay in the comments mic problems no problem so we'll just go through some comments quickly from the slack chat um yeah this is a lot about tectonica a lot of buzz around that and particularly people wanting to join the community and talk about the journal of open source software it's another project uh, people might want to take a look in ah our man has arrived good looks like you're all connected uh, Still not sure I can hear you, but you may still be muted. Do you want to try speaking? How about, how about yeah, now? Yeah, perfect. I can hear you. There's a slight okay. echo, so I will try to speak as little as possible. But no, that's okay. Welcome. Um, yeah, sorry, Mac. 
Mac has, I have to enable like 14 different permissions to enable the microphone <laughs> and the camera. So they try to be helpful and it's sometimes helpful. So, um, okay. So I, I can just share some of my browser. Is that right? Yeah. You can just share your browser Great. directly. Yeah. So, um, well, thanks for, thanks for, uh, for having me. And uh, I haven't been able to attend as much of the transform as I as I had anticipated um, due to life happening and and uh, and everything else. So, um, but in any case, what I wanted to um, uh, and I got my second shot yesterday, so I'm slightly um, slightly under the weather this morning. <laughs> but um, what I wanted to uh, to show this morning, and I'm glad Matt's here because I think it'll. You know, I'm interested to kind of see what he, um, you know, what he thinks about this. I know they've been doing a lot of work on, on uh, strip log over the last, um, you know, week or so. And um, so can you all see that now? Yep. We can see your uh, repo litho log. Yeah. So this is, um, this is under uh, Ross Myers, um, you know, GitHub profile. And this is a, it's a package level extension called LithoLog. Uh, it's a package level extension of, you know, Striplog. And uh, so, you know, I've been, I'm a sedimentary geologist and been collecting a lot of outcrop data, um, you know, for a long time. And the way we collect that kind of data, right, is to go out and measure, uh, you know, go out and measure the grain size, the bed thickness, you know, the different sedimentary structures and those types of things. Um, of, you know, all kinds of clastic and carbonate deposits in order to look at dominantly my, most of my work has been focused on reservoir heterogeneity, um, for oil and gas, right? So looking at lateral connectivity and sort of vertical stacking patterns and, um, and those types of things. And so, but this has always been a very kind of qualitative, um, you know, qualitative process. Sedimentary geology generally, I think has been pretty qualitative. And so, um, we were looking for a way to, um, you know, try to quantify the data that we collect and we spend so much time in the field measuring all of this stuff. Um, and then it just sits in a, you know, it's collected on paper and then it goes into Illustrator or Inkscape or something. And then it's called, you know, digital and it's really not digital. <laughs> and so, um, and so we, um, you know, we wanted a way to represent, you know, different types of um, different types of beds, you know, of different grain sizes. We wanted to enable grain size profiles, you know, through those beds to be able to look at finding upward, coarsening upward, you know, kind of packages and uh, and that sort of thing. So on the left hand side, uh, what you see is an original um, graphic log, a measured section um, through some uh, turbidites in in Chile. And then on the right hand side, that's the digitized version um, plotted using um, litho log, which is using a strip log, you know, sort of container. Um, and so I won't go into the kind of how to get this data di digitally. There are several digitizers, um, one of which is in R that's released by Danny Coots, uh, one of which is in MATLAB um, that was created by myself and a couple other people. Um, and then we're, we want to make one in Python, but it just hasn't really happened yet. So, <laughs> uh, but anyways, you basically go in and you trace, you know, some of these things and there's, there's kind of automatic ways to do it, but they, they only sort of work well, depending on what kind of data, um, that you have. And I know John Armand had just been doing a lot of work on, on that. But anyways, when you get data, um, you know, it'll look something like this, right? You have. Um, some kind of metadata associated here. And then the, the big things that you want is, uh, you know, the meter depth of the top of the bed. That's how we do it. You can do the base as well. Um, and then we provide a thickness. And so the top minus the thickness gives you the, the base, basically. And then here's the grain size at the top. And then there's a whole bunch of other, you know, mean grain size and other things. And then this, um, this column, you, you can see most of these are, are pairs, um, but some of them, if I scroll down here, some of them have a whole bunch of data here. And so those are the, those are the actual depth uh, profiles and the grain size profiles that define those kind of finding upward or coarsening upward uh, packages. So that's kind of what the data, um, you know, looks like that comes out of one of these digitizers. 
and uh, and then you can use you know very similar um, strip log style uh, plotting to um, here, let's see let me scroll up a tiny bit to you know to make different grain size profiles and we have some grain size tools in there to convert millimeter to to um, psi or or phi grain size whichever way you think about it uh, but some kind of log two representation of that because that's the that's the way grain size should be um, dealt with um, and then you know here's that you know inside of inside of one of the um, the uh, beds right which is the same thing as a um, as a strip log sequence then there's um you know in the data here <clears throat> here's that um, the uh, the depth you know of, of one of those uh, kind of grain size profiles, and then here's the grain size in millimeters, and then we converted that to psi, um, you know, using one of those things. So, and by the way, these are just the notebooks that are on the the um, uh, the GitHub, um, and so you can see kind of how that, you know, how one of those uh, beds looks. I made a coarsening upward conglomerate package here and a finding upward sand um, sand bed, and so anyways, and you can plot it. We call it Exxon style. Um, you can plot it Exxon style, which just flips the um, the axis to make it look more, maybe more like a gamma ray log, perhaps. Um, so those are kind of the basics. All the all the kind of I/O works very similar um, to strip log because we're using strip log as as kind of the back end. Um, and then finally, if I grow up here a little bit, you know, you can see kind of how a very basic plot looks that doesn't include grain size information. And then if you include the grain size information, right, you can, um, you know, you can see the, you know, this kind of representation here. So, so it's a, you know, much more reproducible way um, of being able to plot these kind of things at the same scale. And then, of course, storing the data in a true digital fashion is going to enable you to start to do more quantitative um, analyses and all. And I'll show that in a second. So just for example, you can pull, you can pull a single you know, finding upward uh, bed, right, and plot that if you want. This x-axis is grain size here, the y-axis is thickness. Um, or you can pull all of them, right, you can, you know, all of them from a particular section. And then you could start to look at trends in sand beds versus conglomerates and things like that. So those are the kind of detailed things that us said, said people are, are interested in. Um, and then you can also change that, you know, we have some kind of fine um, fine scale and coarse scale um, Wentworth grain size schemes, so you can kind of simplify the uh, the way the axis, you know, plots and things like that. And then we also included a um, a way to flip the the order of the um, you know of the of the strip log basically, so that it'll plot either in depth or in elevation, right? So if you want to make everything have the same kind of um, uh, the same uh, thickness, or or rather, uh, you know, x or y axis profile, you can do that. Um, so finally, I mentioned, you know, there's some demo data that we released with this, and so, um, you know, you can use just some really simple, um, you know, plotting metrics to look at, you know, the the thickness distribution of mud, sand, and um, and gravel, and then start to look at, you know, um, you know, box plots, for example, of different. These are different sections. SDT is one log, and KRF is another log um, that are coming from different formations. And so, um, so anyways, that's the you know the the whole reason we release this is is to be able to plot stuff at the same scale, um, and then to do these types of analyses. Um, and there will be a paper that's uh, that's coming out, um, you know, like hopefully soon that kind of releases these packages and releases a, um, you know, a actual um, kind of a sheet, a logging sheet that we would love people to use. I, I don't feel like people will probably use that very much because <laughs> everyone likes to do things their own way. But, um, you know, but we're, you know, we want to try to make a push for people to collect data, at least in a way that's similar enough to where we can actually compare data among, among workers, which, um, seems like a you know pretty basic task, but it turns out it's much more complicated than it. Than it yeah, seems. sounds like a great initiative for the field camp hookup. Actually, if we can collect the data in a format that goes into lift log, then we can compare compare it all. Uh, I know Brian and myself have spoken at length about this kind of stuff and the challenges with sedimentary logs in the digital age. And it's really great to see something that's solving that problem 
And of course, maybe down the line, it could go into publishing Sedimental Logica. It's a nice, uh, nice conception. Actually, yeah, that's so. Is that journal? Is it? Are they accepting um, uh, submissions yet? Uh, not yet, but you can check with Louisa. Um, I think they're going to be publishing it next. The journal will be live next year. Okay. But, um, yeah, to get get connected uh, with with the relevant people here and uh, give it some thought. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, because we're looking. I mean, of course, we want to publish this in some open access venue. Um, and uh, JSR has been the place where all of these things have been published. But you know, we're willing to pay the open access fee for it. But it's just not mm -hmm. not an ideal situation to no, to pay the open is, access uh, fee and then have the journal charge everyone else for every other paper. So yeah. And there's a diamond open access journal on the way in this area. So guys, if, you know, I'm, I'm sure Louise is still listening. So guys, do hook hook up. Sounds like a good good connection. Thanks for the talk. I uh, appreciate you powering through the uh, jab after effects as well to bring <laughs> yeah. us a great. Yeah, great it's just a little a little foggy right now. Yeah. You know? There, I got my uh, got my text message saying that I'm on the waiting list yesterday. So nice. hopefully uh, we'll all be back to doing this in a chateau again by next year. But uh, yeah. thanks for rounding off two days of excellent talks. Um, and I've been asked by Mr. Filippo now to do a quick plug to say happening on the hour is the Hackathon Roundup of the Hackathon projects for the week. So do jump over to that live session and learn more about, I think Justin mentioned the world correlation. I've seen there's a CCS project, Artash's project, and several other great ones. Thanks again for joining me for the Lightning Talks uh, this year. If Matt will have me, I'd love to be back again hosting them next year. Please, more people get involved. You're going to save me the embarrassment of filling in some of the time. But in the meantime, I hope you've all enjoyed Transform. I hope it's been everything you've expected. And yeah, that's really it from me. Matt, I don't know if you've got any words you want to add or whether we'll uh, finish the session there. But yeah, thanks to all our speakers, attenders, and the guys in the chat. Absolutely, yeah. It's, that's that's all there is. I think, yeah, we pile over to the uh, to Filippo's session with the the hackathon wrap up and see what's going on over there. I haven't. If someone could post a link in T Twenty One General, that'd be awesome because I've lost track, really, to be honest, of channels and links and things. Yeah, there's, and then, a, uh, there's been a lot happening on the. On I the have uh, I have shared said yeah. link. Yeah, more messages than you can shake a stick at wonderful thank you very much again dan really appreciate it um cheers zane and thanks to all the presenters today um really great stuff it's so exciting to see all this activity um yeah see you around in the chateau hopefully and enjoy the rest of transform and then your weekend um yeah in out. the words of the two ronnies it's goodbye from me and it's goodbye from him <laughs> 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 <laughs>